So, hey everyone. I uh, hope you had a nice night of sleep after the packed sessions yesterday. Um, I'm Stefan Ume. I lead the performance team at Gradle. And in this session, I want to show you how you can optimize your own builds for maximum performance. Uh, last, in the last session yesterday, I gave you some prescriptive advice, like do's and don'ts for Android builds. Uh, but still, even if you follow those, you might discover there's some specific problem to your build. So this session is about how to find and eliminate those problems. So why, why do that? Why, go, why spend my time on profiling my build? Maybe nobody's even complaining. I mean, for Android builds, people sure are complaining. <laughs> but you know, once you upgrade to 3.0, maybe it's good enough for many people. Why, why would you bother? Well, look at it this way. Even if you spend like a minor amount of time, let's say 30 seconds on an incremental build, on every incremental build, and you're working in Android Studio, so you're going to do a lot of incremental builds on every change every time you click Run. And let's say you have a medium-sized team, 50 developers. Might be more or less than you have, but uh, just in this relatively small setting, you're already saving 21 hours per day if you optimize those 30 seconds away. And that's 21 hours just pure waiting time. It doesn't even take into account that after roughly 10 seconds, people switch to something else, like checking Twitter or looking at their favorite uh, emergency kittens. So you're losing a lot more time than that, really. But even if we go very conservative and we just say 21 hours, that's three people of those 50 just sitting there twisting thumbs all day. Would you tolerate that if you came into the office and there were three people sitting there just being like eight hours? Nah, not interested in working. Uh, you probably wouldn't. So why would you tolerate your build making them wait like that? And that's, of course, the whole morale problem. Uh, I wouldn't tolerate a 30 second incremental build time. I wouldn't want to develop like that. And nobody in your team wants that either, I guess. So you're going to lose talent if you don't take good care. Yeah. So it's not just about losing money, it's about losing talent as well. So how do you know there's a problem? How do you find that out? Well, especially if you have a bigger team and you can't check in on everybody every day. That's where Gradle Enterprise comes in. So with Gradle Enterprise, you can gather data from all your builds, not just CI builds, and that works with build servers to a certain extent too, but also local builds. And you get this overview of all builds that happened in your whole organization. So you can look and see, hey, what's going on? What are my developers doing? How are they using the build? What are their biggest problems? What's, taking, what's wasting their time? I mean, you could obviously optimize a lot of things in your build. Uh, there's probably more than you can do in the next six months. But what's the most important thing? What's the biggest bang for your buck? With Gradle Enterprise, you can see, oh, hey, my colleague, Will, is calling Gradle clean. Why is he doing that? Is it an education problem? Do I maybe just need to call him or visit him and say, like, hey, Will, did you know that Gradle has really cool incremental build support? Did you know that you don't need to call clean? This is not Maven. Or maybe there is a problem. I've written some tasks that doesn't behave well on incremental builds, and Will is really just working around that problem by calling clean all the time and wasting his developer time. This, if you didn't have this data, you wouldn't know this problem existed, unless Will is very active about communicating with you and telling you, hey, uh, please fix that. But a lot of the time, developers will just accept the pain that just how our build works will just run clean. It's awful. So once you've seen a problem, you can get deep insights from those build scans. So you can look, hey, wh where is the time spent? For instance, I did an incremental assemble here, and it took 34 seconds. What is going on there? And I can see, OK. Task execution took 32 seconds, so I might want to look at 
which tasks are taking so long? Why are they out of date? Uh, I might see configuration time took two seconds almost. That's pretty long. Why is that? So I could look at the breakdown of that. And you can export all this data to your favorite business intelligence tool. Uh, I used to have my own slide here, but when I thought of the keynote yesterday, uh, I immediately threw it away <laughs> and inserted the Tableau example because that was really sweet. Uh, so this is an example from Tableau where they uh, exported the data from Gretel Enterprise and graphed it and said, okay, check style was somewhat taking a long time. Uh, and actually, people were kind of accepting it. And it was even regressing at some point because people had so gotten used to that check style just takes a long time uh, that nobody cared when it got even slower, almost twice as slow suddenly. And then somebody finally sat down and fixed this problem. And they can immediately see how this affected their whole developer experience. You can immediately see fixes implemented, everybody is saving a minute every day or more. So this is how you learn what the problems in your organizations are. And of course, you can also walk around, go to your colleagues, be like, hey, what are you waiting for? Uh, do pair programming, because it's really, really awkward when you pair program and you have to wait for 30 seconds and just sit there. Uh, so it's a great, uh, a great way to, to force you to think about productivity. Because if you're alone, it's, it's so easy to just do something else. So now, you kind of know what your problem is. You know, OK, um, an incremental assemble takes a long time. Now what? Um, so I've created this example project. Well, the Google team originally created it. I just piggybacked my changes on it. Uh, and this project has nine sub-projects, 500 Java files, 1.7K XML files, final APK size of 50 megabytes, so it's a reasonably sizable application. And it has a lot of problems. Uh, when I originally forked it, it had a configuration time of two seconds. A single line change to a method body took 30 seconds to repackage. And the clean build took a full minute. So here is uh, a, a build scan of an up-to-date assemble. Like, nothing, nothing changed. And you can look and see, OK, where's, where's my time being spent? Total build time, four seconds. Spent one second configuring my projects. Spent two seconds executing tasks. Uh, you can see how much garbage collection is happening as well. So this is the first indication, where is your time spent? And we're going to look at each of those build phases individually. Who knows exactly what configuration time and running tasks are, what the difference is? OK, good. So we do need some explanation here. So configuration means you start up Gradle, and we connect to the Gradle daemon. And then you have in your project a bunch of plugins. You have build scripts. And all of those need to be executed to know which tasks there even are to execute. And then we can take the task that the user asks us for, like assemble debug, and see what do we need to run for this task to be completed. So we first need to build this model of your project to know what are all the tasks, what are the dependencies, et cetera. And we always need to build this model. So configuration time happens on every build. That means if you do something expensive there, you're going to slow down every single build. Whereas execution time, we only execute the tasks that the user selected. So you want to defer work to execution time. And we're going to look at some bad practices, and how to spot them. <coughs> but first, let's take some general advice, completely independently of which build phase we're talking about. First of all, always stay up to date with your Gradle versions. Um, minor version upgrades are very smooth. Uh, we have pretty strict backwards compatibility constraints. 
Uh, it's one of the highest priorities for the team. And when you continuously upgrade to the latest minor version of the current major release that you're on, you will also get deprecation warnings if we're planning to remove something in the next major release. So that gives you an early warning so you can prepare for that next major release. Uh, so if there's something in your build scripts that's using some outdated API, or maybe you're using a community plugin that is using some outdated API, you can at least let that plugin author know, give him or her an early warning uh, so that once the next major version comes out, you'll be ready. And major versions often bring tremendous performance improvements. Gradle 4.0 is no exception. We did a lot of improvements around dependency resolution, even independent of the Android plugin, just the basic mechanics of it. Uh, we now download dependencies in parallel, so when you check out a project for the first time, you're going to get a workable workspace much quicker. But the most important reason to upgrade is, of course, because Gradle 4.0 enables the new Android plugin 3.0, which is currently in alpha. And you should definitely give that a try, because it fundamentally changes how the Android plugin works. Uh, you see, the Android plugin, you all know, has different variants of your app, for instance, a debug or production variant or an x86 and ARM variant, etc. And it used to analyze all the dependencies of all those variants at configuration time. And I just told you that configuration time needs to be fast for builds to be fast. It would resolve all those dependencies to build its model. And it was not the Android team's fault. They were just missing APIs in Gradle. And we finally added them in 4.0. Uh, it's called Variant Aware Dependency Management. So now the Android plugin can do the minimum amount of work to build just the variant that you asked for. Because when you're working in Android Studio, you obviously selected one variant of the many variants that your application has. And you just want to build that. So this leads to a tremendous performance improvement. It also improves parallelization. Because we can go even more fine-grained with the variants. Uh, basically, on the, on the low mechanical level, the manifests and the classes and the resources of a project are also a variant of it. So the Android plugin can now say, I want to merge my resources. Give me all the resources of the libraries. And as soon as those resources are ready, it can start merging them, even while the libraries are still compiling, for instance. So it's also much more parallelizable now. So you definitely want to give that a try. Apart from that, you want to look out for some red flags. And these are the numbers that I recommend you uh, follow. If Gradle takes more than a second to start up, so the build scan says startup time is bigger than one second, you probably have a problem with your daemon. So you want to make sure that this is below one second. If your build scan says your configuration time is above one second, um, it can happen for very large projects. But it's unlikely for any reasonably like 100 project, sub-project build to be above one second. If it's above one second, there's probably an inefficient plugin in there or some bad practice in your build scripts. So take a look at that. A single line change taking more than 10 seconds to assemble. Uh, this really is the magic number, I think, because, as I said, after 10 seconds, general rule of thumb, people switch to something else. And you really want to avoid that. You really want to avoid taking them out of the flow. And another red flag is when you run a task and you change nothing, and you run the same task again, when Gradle executes anything, so you have any task executed, it's also a red flag. It means some of your tasks are not properly incremental. So how do, you, how do you measure? How do you know those numbers? Of course, you can just manually <laughs> click in Android Studio, or you could run on the CLI again and again. But it gets old pretty quickly. And it's also hard to communicate with colleagues. Like, did you, what, what, what kind of scenario did you run? Did, did you change this file? Uh, did you warm up the daemon before? Uh, how many warm-ups did you run? So it can get really confusing when people send numbers back and forth and say, no, I can't reproduce those five seconds. I only see three, et cetera. That's why we built the Gradle profiler. Uh, you can go on GitHub uh, 
and just install it locally and use it to profile your Gradle builds. And it has this really neat DSL that allows you to define your scenario. So you can say, hey, I want to measure a clean build. So clean up tasks is clean, and the task I want to run is built. Or I want to measure a cache clean build. I want to approximate configuration time by calling Gradle help. And it also supports changing your sources. So you can say, I want to apply a ABI breaking change to this source file and then reassemble and see how long that takes. So you can just check that scenario file in, and then everybody on your team can do reproducible performance measurements. So let's just look at that in action real quick. So here is tell the Gradle profiler to benchmark configuration time. And it'll analyze my projects, or extract the memory settings that I gave my projects. And then it'll warm up the build a few times and then run a bunch of builds and do a average and standard deviation, et cetera, over all those runs. And then they can take that uh, CSV file that comes out of it and send it to my colleagues and say, like, here, uh, I, I just benchmarked and we're saving a full second now. Uh, and I can also profile with, I can create build scans, for instance. I can tell the Gradle profiler, hey, warm it up 10 times and then create a build scan so that I don't get flaky results because I didn't warm it up properly, for instance. You can also use JProfiler or your kit with it. Uh, you can also use JFR, but it doesn't give me great results, so I generally uh, stick with the two big commercial profilers. They're, they're really good at uh, analyzing low-level performance problems. OK, so let's look at the first phase of your build. Startup. What can go wrong there? Really nothing much. There's not much, there's no user code that runs in there. It's really just all about making sure that your daemon is warmed up. When you start a new Gradle daemon, you get a cold VM, you get interpreted code instead of compiled code. So everything is very slow the first few runs. Uh, we also need to load up a bunch of caches from disk back into memory. So the first build with a cold daemon is usually quite slow. Uh, so if you have some environment problem where maybe you're assigning way too much memory to your daemon and you're building two different projects that are both fighting for eight gigs of RAM, then they might tell each other to, hey, can, can you please shut yourself down? I need to run and I need all this memory here. And then next time you run the other project, it's like, hey, can you shut yourself down because I need all your memory? Uh, so you might end up killing daemons off all the time and you want to avoid that. So uh, it might be fighting for system resources, for instance. So here in this case, uh, this daemon has been around for three builds, so it's probably performing well now. Uh, so when you see a build scan, the first thing you should look at, if it's unusually slow, was this run with the daemon? And was the daemon fresh? Was it cold? Or was it well warmed up? Next up is configuration time. So We've loaded up the projects, and now we're applying plugins. So configuration time consists of applying all the plugins to your projects, like the Android plugin or the Crashlytics plugin, applying all your build scripts to those projects, and also applying any after-evaluate hooks that those plugins registered. So this is one common misconception that I saw sometimes um, that plugin developers thought by putting something in after-evaluate, they can somehow avoid uh, doing it, but all after Elliot hooks are still run on every project. It's just a mechanism so that plugins can react to whatever happened when evaluating the build scripts. So user puts some input in the build script, and then the plugin can later react to that input. And configuration time runs on any task. Gradle help, Gradle tasks. If it takes five seconds to configure your build, it takes five seconds for a developer to know what tasks are available in your build. That's incredibly painful. Uh, it's basically the first experience that people have with your build. They look, OK, what, what's available here? Gradle tasks. Five seconds? Oh, no, I don't want to work with this project. Uh, it also affects Android Studio Sync. Every time you sync, we need to configure the project in order to provide the model to Android Studio. So configuration time is really important for your developer experience. 
So what, what can go wrong here? Uh, the first thing you want to look at is in the dependency resolution tab of your build scan, you'll see a breakdown when dependencies were resolved. And if you see anything at all at project configuration time, that's a big red flag. You don't want to resolve dependencies at configuration time because you want to resolve only the dependencies that you need for the tasks that you're running. But if you always resolve some uh, configuration, then you're going to do that work no matter which task is run, which is probably a big waste. So here in this build, we're spending 170 milliseconds resolving my app runtime. Why are we doing that? Well, look, let's look at the build script of my app. And this is right off of Stack Overflow. <laughs> Top voted answer for how do I build an Uber jar. And it's, it's really a pity I only have one downvote. Uh, so I <laughs> don't know if that can be changed, but I really want 100. Uh, because this is screwing with your performance. And it's also very brittle. What this is doing is it's saying, hey, from configurations, runtime.collect. And this .collect is an eager call that leads to getting all the files and then applying this closure to those files. So this is going to go at configuration time, resolve all those dependencies, potentially download them, and unzip them all at configuration time, even if I don't call this task. So how do I fix it? Well, anywhere that Gradle accepts a file collection, it'll also accept the closure. So I just wrap this whole thing in a closure, thereby telling Gradle, there is something here that I want you to package into that jar when I actually run this task. And since this is now an opaque kind of piece of code, I need to tell Gradle the runtime configuration is an input to this task so that any projects, for instance, that need to be compiled before I can uh, run this task are actually compiled. Same, uh, same thing with I.O. at configuration time. So uh, this is a very common mistake. Uh, who can spot what the problem is here? No do last. Yeah. So this is configuring the task. And what are we doing? At configuration time, we're writing something into that text file. That's not what we wanted. So you can see here in the build scan, my app, the my app build script, took 241 milliseconds to execute. So that way I know there's something going on there at configuration time that's really expensive. Uh, and if I wanted to know exactly what is going on, then build scans will be improved in the future to spot more I.O. But some, some stuff like I just do a new file and write something to it is very hard to capture. So at that point, you might want to go down and use, for instance, JProfiler or YoKit together with the Gradle profiler. And then you'll see below that app's build script calls to Java I.O. file, write, etc. So that way you would tell where this time is coming from. How do I fix it? Well, I wrap the actual writing into a do last block there by telling Gradle, this is the action of this task. Please only do this when this task is really executed. And I tell it, the input to this is the main Java sources, and the output is my stats file. Now, ideally, you would write this as a custom task, because that makes the separation way clearer it's way less spaghetti code. Uh, so I would always recommend, if you have custom tasks, write them as classes. So I can say if project stats is a task and it takes sources, those are input files, and it has an output file. And the action, that's where the expensive stuff happens. That's stats file text equals source files size. And then in my project, I just say, hey, create me one of those project stats tasks, please. And the sources are source main Java, and the stats file is built there stats.txt. That would be the preferred way of solving this problem. Uh, next, what I found in this, uh, in this example uh, that, that I wrote for, for configuration time problems was an inefficient plugin. You can 
don't know if you can read it, but there's a give me the version from the git revision plugin that's taking about seven milliseconds for every project. Now, I just exaggerated this problem by adding 100 subprojects. So this is like in total taking 700 milliseconds uh, to get the git status and assign it to the version number for every project. So this is the code for that piece. There's a, a script plugin saying, run some git command, then put it into the project's version, and then it's applied for every subproject. Uh, and the solution is pretty easy. It's just do it once. Do it once in the root project, and then just say, for all my subprojects, that's the version. Yeah? Do expensive logic once. All right, let's move on to execution time. Um, so execution time consists of selecting all the tasks that need to be run to fulfill what the user asked for. So when I say assemble debug, well, there's a whole graph of tasks that need to be run before that. Um, Gradle will run those incrementally. So if any of those tasks input didn't change, then it will just skip them. Um, some tasks are even incremental on the individual file level, like Java compilation. It can parallelize those tasks. So you might have heard at the keynote or in uh, Gary's talk that Gradle will soon parallelize a lot of things by default, like Java compilation, like dexing. Um, but there's also the dash dash parallel flag that we'll talk about later. And tasks are also cacheable so that you can share uh, the results of running tasks across machines. So how do we make sure that these features actually work? So when I executed this Santa Tracker app, one thing I saw was I was doing an up-to-date assemble, and it still took quite a bit of time. And there was this one task that had a constantly changing input. So I looked deeper into the timeline view in the build scan, and I saw, ah, merge manifest is out of date because the value of the input property version code has changed. Why is that? Well, there's this plugin called Crashlytics that puts a unique identifier into my manifest. So it does that to, it's, it's a reasonable thing actually, uh, it's a reasonable functionality. It does that so that when a user uploads a crash report, uh, I actually know which build that came from. But do I need that for developer builds? No. Oh. Developer ran the build locally. They know exactly that it's their code that they're running currently. So they don't need this correlation, like which build did it come from. So for a developer build, you just want to switch that off. And I've seen many of these kinds of mistakes, like putting a timestamp into the jar manifest. A lot of plain Java projects do that because I don't know. That's what we've always done. <laughs> we put as much information in our manifest as possible just in case. Um, and you can keep doing that. Just don't do it for developer builds. Um, so in general, the timestamp is just one example. Uh, if you say the jar manifest should contain a timestamp, what you're basically saying is this jar task depends on the current time in milliseconds. Is that really true? Is that really something that you want to do on developer builds? So just like that, you should ask yourself for every input, especially for your custom tasks, what does it really need? Do I really need to run all this stuff to execute this? Uh, what I, for instance, often see is custom tasks that depend on assemble when they really just need the classes. Why would you depend on assembling everything, all the jars and all the variants of your project, when you really just need the classes of one variant? Yeah? Think very deeply about what are the minimum inputs of your task. You need to specify all inputs, otherwise it's not correct. But you don't want to specify more, because otherwise it gets slower than necessary. Um, now, you have kind of minimized your inputs on the, on the task level, but still one change uh, rebuilds almost everything, then you probably have one big monolithic app. Uh, that's very common, uh, not just in Android projects, also in Java enterprise projects still, especially in legacy migrations. So in that case, 
You just need to break your project down into smaller modules. Extract some libraries so that when you change that library, only that needs to be rebuilt. That's also one way to increase incrementality. There's a whole talk on this topic uh, on the last slot today by my colleague Cedric Champo. So he will talk about how Gradle achieves maximum incrementality with API implementation separation, compile avoidance, and incremental compile. So if you're interested in that, you can visit that talk or read the blog post that Cedric wrote a while ago. Now, the next thing that you'll see in the timeline is also the level of parallelism of your build. So here, I executed the center tracker uh, clean assemble dev debug task, and it took 32 seconds. And you see a serial timeline. Now, this project has nine project, nine subprojects. Wouldn't it be nice to do some of that work at the same time? And that's what you can do with the dash dash parallel flag. So what that parallel tells Gradle is basically, trust me, my projects are decoupled. They don't influence each other while their tasks are run. So you can run them in parallel. And this was the only way to parallelize up until now with Gradle. Uh, since Gradle 4.0 and throughout the 4.x stream, we will uh, use that API everywhere. We now have the worker API that allows us to parallelize by default and that allows you as plugin developers to write parallelizable tasks that can par be parallelized by default without the user opting into this kind of unsafe dash dash parallel mode. Uh, why is it unsafe? Well, it's actually very hard to know whether your tasks are truly decoupled. Uh, all it takes is two tests trying to access the same database and adding or deleting from the same table. That already means you can't use dash dash parallel which is kind of a pity because if it's just these two tests and everything else would be perfectly parallelizable, you're missing out on a lot of goodness. That's why we're going to get rid of this crude flag uh, in the long run and everything will use this new worker API where I can say on the task-based level, submit this piece of work, run it in parallel, um, and then we can say on a task-per-task -task basis, for instance, these tests, they are perfectly are safe to run in parallel. This test needs access to that database, so make sure that nobody else is accessing that database while I run this test. So we can get much more fine-grained in the future. Um, speaking of tests, so if you can't use dash dash parallel, still your tests are probably the most expensive thing in your build. Um, and if the tests in one test task are actually uh, able to run in parallel, then you can tell Gradle, hey, run a bunch of forks for this test task. So, for instance, run four parallel forks and push tests to four parallel workers. So that is one way. If your build is not able to run with dash dash parallel and uh, there's not enough running in parallel by default yet, you can use this to at least parallelize the most expensive part of your build, which is probably running the tests. And last but not least is memory. Oh, my favorite uh, source of fear, uncertainty, and doubt <laughs> on Stack Overflow. So you, you might have seen people telling you to just give your Android build six gigs of RAM. Uh, please don't do that. <laughs> so even, even very large projects that we've seen don't need more than one, maybe two gigs of RAM. Like the biggest that I know of uh, runs perfectly fine with two gigs on Gradle 4.0 and Android 3.0. Um, why is it bad to give more, more RAM than needed? Well, you make your full garbage collection pauses longer because the JVM has to scan a bigger heap. And you also could, it could also lead to demons fighting for system resources when one says, hey, I, I want to have four gigs, and the other says, well, I want to have four gigs too. Uh, you pretty quickly run out of system resources. Um, another, yeah, yes, please go. Yeah, so uh, Dex in process um, is now the default. Uh, it has been, right now, it has been improved a lot to be much more memory efficient. I don't know if you've used 3.0. Yeah, this is definitely 3.0. Okay, so there, there, like, there were lots of improvements to Dexing to make it more memory efficient. So you'll definitely see some improvements there, I think. Um, 
independently of that, if you have like a really, really big number of libraries and Dex just does take a lot of memory, then uh, in 3.0 final, it will actually run in a daemon process. So the reason Dex was pulled in process was that we didn't want to pay the price of forking a process every time. But Gradle now has this worker API, which allows plugins to say, I want to run this um, code in a daemon process. Yeah? So the main Gradle daemon connects to another daemon that's just there for dexing. So set the you set the memory of that one separately, exactly. And that means the garbage collection cost is limited to that dex daemon. Uh, so the main build will not suffer from this dex daemon. Uh, It definitely is. You should definitely look uh, into reducing your, your maximum memory when you switch to 4.0 slash 3.0. And it really just takes some experimentation to find the optimal number. So if you're thrashing, you need more. But if you're not even close to reaching the max memory you allocated, you really want to reduce it. So the uh, last topic uh, that's mainly for the build masters and plugin authors uh, not so much for the end users, is uh, optimizing build logic. So how do I make sure I can find problems in my build scripts easily? Uh, you saw that build scans break down performance by scripts. Uh, so it's really a good idea if you have a big build script to break it down into smaller pieces, break it down into script plugins and apply those. And then in the build scan, you will see which of those scripts is taking most of the time. Um, to make it even more efficient, extract that into a build source, make it statically compiled plugin in Java or Kotlin or at compile static Groovy. Yeah. Um, so basically, my recommendation is build scripts and script plugins should be for declarative things. So one example might be, here's a script plugin that configures my test tasks. It says, like, I want to use forking, and I want to refork every 1,000 tests, and uh, I'm going to use this test framework, et cetera. That's declarative. That's fine. Um, when you're starting to write custom tasks or doing some elaborate computations to determine the optimal settings for some task, et cetera, then you really want to put that into build source. Because the other benefit of build source is that you can run uh, write functional tests. So you can actually test your build logic before you execute your build and thereby find problems much earlier. And then as you write more elaborate build logic, you will at some point find, oh, well, build scans are telling me that this plugin is taking long, or this script is taking long to apply, but I don't see why. Uh, and at that point, you can use the Gradle profiler with any of the big major commercial profilers, like JProfiler or UKit, for instance, uh, to see at the method level what's going on. So that's like the last step. Once you've optimized you know, all the inputs, et cetera, you want to know, OK, I have this custom task. It's calling out to this tool that we have. And for some reason, it's taking a bunch of memory. Why? That's the way you find out. OK, so let's look at the results. After taking this Santa Tracker app, um, pushing it through all the best practices from yesterday, and also optimizing all the build scripts uh, with what we learned today. Uh, here's configuration time. Boom. <laughs> so it wasn't that horrible before. Uh, we've seen much worse. We've seen projects that took 10, 20 seconds to configure. And just removing some dependency resolution and configuration time, put it down to five seconds. And then removing some inefficient plugins or rewriting some inefficient plugins, took it down to one. Uh, so you can really save a lot of time. The Incremental build is much more impressive still. So thanks to all the improvements that were made to avoid work, we actually complete in four seconds here. So we made a single line change in a library. And that change no longer rippled through all the other tasks because it was a non-ABI change. So we just changed the method body. So nobody actually had to be recompiled uh, because only the implementation changed. So we're short-circuiting all that work. Yeah, it's still running. <laughs> 35 versus 4 seconds. And 4 seconds, I mean, 
I'm sure there's still some improvements here. For instance, this is run on the command line. When you run with instant run in Android Studio, it's another 50% faster because we don't need to package the app. We just need to compute the diff of which classes need to be redeployed. And while well, the clean build is extra painful, uh, I'm going to spare you the full clean build run on the left side because it takes a full minute. And on the right side, it's just 22 seconds. So it'll actually almost complete three times in the optimized version before the unoptimized version will finish. It also feels much faster just because of the new console. So I, I really love it. Like uh, when the core team pushed that, uh, I was so happy because Gradle finally has some sane output, well, except for all the warnings that tools are spitting out, of course. <laughs> but at least I don't see all this uninteresting stuff like, oh, yeah, this task was up to date. This task was up to date. Well, it's cool. Why do you tell me that? <laughs> now, uh, since you probably won't remember everything that I just said, here's a bunch of resources that you consult afterwards. Uh, there's the Gradle Performance Guide, where I, we explain all the general Gradle recommendations that also apply to Android builds to a large extent. Um, the Google team has written an Android Performance Guide. That's excellent. You should definitely have a look at that. They've also written a migration guide to the new Android Studio um, or Android plugin 3.0. So if you're struggling with that, if your build was using some things that have been changed, that's the place to look. Um, and for built script and plugin authors, we also have the plugin development guide that touches on some performance related topics like uh, incremental task inputs and the structuring build logic guide that tells you like how to use script plugins and build source to structure your build logic. Go ahead. Yes, the Android 3.0 plugin is in Alpha 4. It's in Alpha 4 right now. And yeah. Um, so is there still kind of like a pretty strong risk of that making breaking changes? Um, I would have to defer the question if there's a risk of strong breaking changes to the Google team. Uh, Zaf, want to? It's possible. <laughs> uh, we don't want to, but it's possible. Yeah. But it has been actually pretty stable uh, since Alpha 1. So actually quite surprised, I got to say, uh, how well that worked out. Um, I would definitely start using it maybe on a branch. Just you know, keep up to date with the changes there. Um, and maybe get a few developers on it, a few brave souls. If your build is very complex, it might still, it might still change. Um, with the projects that, that we tried, it was perfectly fine. Yeah, if everyone tries it, then they can't break it. So everybody <laughs> migrate, and then the Google team can't break it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right. So if you have any performance related questions for Android, just ask on Stack Overflow. For Gradle, there's discuss.gradle.org. Um, if you have found a performance issue, you've optimized your build, you're pretty sure it's not your fault, uh, and you think it's in the Android plugin, then just attach a your kit or jprofiler snapshot to your bug report to the Android uh, issue tracker. Same goes for Gradle. If you think there's a problem in Gradle, then just attach a snapshot to a GitHub issue, or if it's confidential, you can also send it to performance at gradle.com. That's not a support channel, so don't expect an immediate answer. Um, but we will look into it, and if we find a bug in Gradle, we will fix it. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe I can take one or two questions, and then I'll be outside. Yes. So a lot, a lot of those recommendations apply to all Gradle builds. So the way you profile an Android build is not different from profiling any other Gradle builds. I just took Android-specific examples in, this, uh, in these slides. But I have another talk today for uh, you know, Java developers on the, other, on the developer productivity track. Uh, so if you saw this one, you don't need to attend to the other one, because the approach is the same. 
Any other questions for now? Cool. I'll be outside. Thanks a lot.